This is What's It Like with Dr. Ken Tangen. Hi, I'm Ken Tangen. My guest is Anthony Stouffer. You know him, of course, from the frozen food family. Yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> do you get that a lot? Uh, once in a while. Actually, Anthony knows a lot more about guitars than he does frozen food. <laughs> I was a bachelor for many years. Don't pay, don't put any bets on that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe both areas of expertise. And he teaches guitar. How many videos do, have you actually made now? If you add up all of the free ones uh, and all the premium ones, it's probably getting close to 160 or 170. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, I've been busy. Yeah, I guess so. You started off not, I assume, playing guitar. You must have learned it at one point in time. Yeah, I uh, well, I was a musician my whole life because in my family there wasn't really any choice. So I did piano as a kid and then taught myself to play drums. But I didn't really touch guitar until uh, I was a senior in high school. <laughs> it's the strangest story. A friend needed to borrow some money. So <laughs> as collateral, I took his electric guitar and amp for a couple of months. And I uh, had no idea what I was doing, uh, but I really fell in love with it for the few months that I had it. So then when it came time for graduation and my parents were going to buy me a graduation gift, they ended up just buying back this guitar and amplifier that I returned to them. <laughs> and so that's kind of how it started is, uh, wow. is loan sharking. And that's, <laughs> that's how I got into playing guitar. But I was a senior in high school. And then I spent my whole college years learning how to play. So. Where did you grow up? I grew up in good old Mannheim, Pennsylvania, which is right in the middle of Lancaster County. Lancaster County. All I know is farm country. It's a farm country and tourist trap because everybody ah. likes to come see the Amish people. So. so you were not part of the Amish? Uh, no, we were a few steps removed. <laughs> yes, I said, but, but not far? <laughs> if you're familiar at all with uh, the different Mennonite and Brethren denominations, you realize there's finely graded steps uh, Amish all the way up to everything else. I see. So you're more Amish light. <laughs> yeah, if you want to call it that. <laughs> so what was your childhood like? Well, uh, my dad was a car mechanic and my mom was a stay at home mom, at least while we were young. Um, we lived, uh, we lived in the middle of a little town for a while. And then when I was about 10, we moved to a farmhouse. So I grew up in farmland, I worked on a farm when I was like 12 years old on a pig farm. Uh, so really, really uh, blue collar, not industrial, but more agricultural. Musically, we all, you know, my mom was a music teacher before she was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, they were always the music leaders at our church. Uh, so we all took piano lessons. We didn't, I don't want to say we didn't have a choice, <laughs> uh, but it was just, that's just something we did. So uh, we were always singing together both with my family and then with my extended family whenever we'd get together uh, for family gatherings. So music all the time, not a whole lot of rock and mm -hmm. roll <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. You learn to sing parts at a young age? Oh, yeah. Men Mennonites do four-part mm -hmm. harmony as good as anybody. <laughs> you learn the, the note shapes. Yes. In, in the hymn books. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. The Northerners and the Southerners all agree on that. The yes. shape note version of it. <laughs> Yep. So did you have a favorite childhood possession? Depends which year you ask me. Uh, I was heavily into baseball from the ages of like two <laughs> until until we moved towns and then I couldn't play anymore because there was no team within driving distance. Uh, so probably my baseball bat and mitt because I was a pretty serious baseball player in elementary school. Uh-huh. Home Run Handle was my nickname <laughs> in the T-Ball League. <laughs> well, that's a good nickname. It doesn't sound like one they would taunt you with. Uh, no, I was the oldest kid there because <laughs> it's September birthday. So I was right on that dividing line where I could have I went either way. And so my parents uh -huh. opted for older. <laughs> so I, was, I was a full year older than most of the other kids in the league. So that was fun. What was your major challenge in school? Um, let me think here. Uh, I don't remember much of, you know, elementary school in that regard, but I do have distinct memories of junior high and high school feeling very challenged by classes that I was not interested in. Mm. I didn't have a whole lot of classes that I thought were difficult 
other than the difficulty of having to sit through them when I didn't care about them. Right. Other classes that most people would have thought were really, really hard, uh, if I enjoyed it, then I did, I did really, really well. Mm-hmm. But boredom was a big, a big obstacle to my grade point average. Aside from the fact that nobody explained to me what GPA was and how it could possibly affect your entrance to college. So <laughs> I, I was in all the level one classes, and while my friends were worrying about not getting a 4.0, I hadn't even started thinking about my GPA until I was a senior. Come to realize that all of these people around me had been watching their grades, and I had just been kind of taking school as it came to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little late to that party. That was very zen of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take it as it comes. What did you do after high school? Well, uh, pretty much solely due to my mom's persistent prodding, I went to Penn State University. Uh, and I mean it where, when I say that I wasn't thinking about it all. Literally, she filled out all the scholarship applications. And I only went to see my guidance counselor because she, you know, somehow, even though she didn't go to college, I know she had wanted to, and, and my dad didn't go to college, she had this idea in her mind that her kids had to go to college. And so literally my whole junior year, which I guess is the year you're supposed to do that, she's constantly talking about school. And my decision about where to go to school was literally decided in one conversation when I told somebody that I liked to take apart electronics. <laughs> it was my high school physics teacher. He said, uh, I think he said his son goes to Penn State, and they've got a good electrical engineering program. I was like, all right, well, I'll go there. So <laughs> for some reason, I'm not sure how it happened, but that was the only place that I applied. And uh, and got in. I got assigned to a branch campus, but uh, I don't know how she did it. My mom made a phone call and gave him a sob story about how all my friends were going to University Park, <laughs> and it would be terrible if I couldn't go. So I switched to Undecided. Uh, instead of electrical engineering right away, and I got to go to University Park, and then a semester later, I was in the engineering program. So, so yeah, <laughs> when I uh, to paint a picture of a guy who's going through high school not thinking about the future at all that that was me. Not that I w- didn't work hard at school, mm-hmm. but I had no vision of anything past high school, and it's only because of the you know uh, urging of my mom that I even thought about it. So, engineering seems like a kind of a competitive area i uh, i came to find that out <laughs> <laughs> fortunately for me i was uh i was interested in almost everything engineering related that i had to study when i got to school and by some stroke of luck calculus was something that my brain seemed wired to do so the classes that some people hit a wall with. Uh, I had them in high school and did well and then did poorly enough on my entrance exams that I got to take them again, which resulted in an easy A my freshman year of college. (laughs) Um, But it got really competitive my junior year because that's when you hit the real serious electrical engineering stuff. And uh, then I ran into the same problems that I had in high school where the classes that I enjoyed, I did really well in, but the classes that I found boring or I wasn't intellectually invested in were very challenging to get through. Uh, it was just challenging to find the motivation to do that work instead of play guitar. And did you finish college? Oh, yeah. Four years. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think I was blissfully unaware of how treacherous college can be for some people. And so the idea of going an extra year uh, whether it be because of the extra money or whatever, it just wasn't an option. And uh, unlike some people, there was no question in my mind what I was going to get my major in. I mean, I, I still talk to kids today who get to the third year of college and still trying to figure out what they wanted to do with their life. And I didn't know if I was going to play guitar for a living, but I knew if I didn't, I was going to do something with engineering because I enjoyed it. So even from my freshman year, there was no question about, am I going to switch majors? Am I? Gonna... I mean, that those things never even came up in college. So... I didn't have any of that uh, angst that some people have in deciding what you want to do with your life. Uh, it was more or less just get through it. Now, my senior year, I had a, a pretty bad case of senioritis, and I just wanted to get out of there. But uh, there was, yeah, there was no danger of going an extra year or anything like that because it, it wasn't a mystery, you know, how I was going to finish. Mm-hmm. Now that you've survived childhood, what constitutes family for you? <laughs> well, I'm married, and I have a two-year-old son, so. 
after I graduated college, uh, I was a bachelor here in town for a while. I ended up getting a job that I found out about the last day of classes of my senior year of college. So that's yet another example of somebody not, not thinking about the future. Everybody else was polishing their resumes and going to job seminars, and I was still trying to come to terms with whether or not I wanted to go work for the man because uh, I fancied myself a rebel musician. Uh, but then uh, <clears throat> found out about a job last day of classes of my senior year, ended up getting interview and an offer and two weeks later. And so then I just stayed in town a couple years later, found a new church. Two years later, I met the girl who had become my wife and now we're married, have a house here. She works at Penn state and I've got a little two year old toddler baby boy that keeps me quite busy. I bet. So yeah, that's my family. Oh, and my parents live up here now too. So I've oh, got how nice. a closer. So, so what's it like being a father? Uh, the best way that I can think to describe it to, to somebody who hasn't done it, is that uh, depending on your level of experience with children, and in my case was almost none, it will stretch you emotionally beyond what you've ever experienced in every way possible. <laughs> so <laughs> you will feel things both positive and challenging uh, on a much deeper level than you've felt about anything else. <laughs> and so, I mean, really, it makes you a, a much wider person than you were before because you're capable of things that previously you you wouldn't have been able to tolerate. But also the reward for that is you get to feel things for your child that you've never felt, you know, for another human being before. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a giant stretching process for me. Um, and so I, you know, like one of my coworkers told me, you're... <laughs> Sometimes you just have to remember the good times. <laughs> well, even when you, even when your children are being difficult, you know, he was saying that remember, remember the times that they were the cutest they've ever been, and that will help you get through those times when they're more challenging than you could have ever imagined. <laughs> this is a terrible segue, but it seems like it is a, a stretch to go from electrical engineering to playing guitar. Yeah. I would agree that it seems like a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> and the the only way that I can reconcile it is that um, for me and the style of guitar that I like, uh, music is a very two-faced thing for me. On one hand, it's a great outlet uh, emotionally uh, because I've even when I was a kid, I was always one of those people that you know, my emotions were all on, you know, I was just, I was not reserved. You know, my mom wrote in her journal when I was two years old that I did everything that I did with great gusto. <laughs> that carried through to my high school years. You know, if I'd have a breakup or something like that, it was the worst thing in the world. You know, so I had a healthy uh, amount of emotion to express, especially when I got to college. Uh, and music was a tremendous outlet in that way. But on an engineering angle, the style of music that I played, I, I mainly studied the playing of Stevie Ray Vaughan and, and to some extent Jimi Hendrix and Albert King. And I found the actual mechanics of their playing very, very mathematical. Hmm. And I didn't approach it at all from a music theory perspective. I mean, I remembered basic music theory from my childhood, and so I was able to find my way around the songs. But I wasn't thinking about, oh, is he playing this scale or that scale? I was seeing like little licks here and there that combined almost like an equation to form a larger lick. So even though it was this really, really expressive thing, uh, it was almost like an engineering problem to me to figure out how to learn some of this stuff because I knew if I just learned the underlying principles and the parts, I'd be able to replicate it. So um, it sounds so terribly uh, unartistic, if that's even a word, to talk about music that way. But, uh, you know, on the days when I wasn't feeling down, you know, I still had that angle that kept bringing me back that it was, it was like trying to solve an engineering problem, mm -hmm. trying to learn, trying to learn a song. Um, so in that regard, it's not, it's not too much of a stretch to me. Yeah. So what exactly do you do? Uh, well, I run a website called steviesnacks.com, and uh, on this website, I publish free 
guitar lessons, uh, more or less in the general style of Stevie Ray Vaughan for people who like that style of playing. Turns out there's a lot more than I thought there would be. And Stevie Ray Vaughan is? He was a, a blues guitarist who came into his own around 1983 uh, at a time when the blues was kind of hurting. And he was this skinny white kid from Texas who played his heart out and kind of ignited a revival around the blues and he burned fast and short, and his career took off. He won a Grammy, and then he died tragically in 1990 in a helicopter crash. And uh, his legend has only continued to get bigger. Mm. Uh, and as I found out in the years I've been running Stevie Snacks, that there are literally there are kids in Eastern Europe sitting in their bedrooms trying to play like Stevie Ray Vaughan. It's the, there are kids in India. Playing their guitars, trying to play the blues like Stevie Ray Vaughan, it's the, it's the most bizarre thing in the world to think about. Um, but anyway, that's what grabbed a hold of me in college, and so that's kind of what I do. And then to earn income, basically, aside from the free lessons, I put a lot of time and energy into planning more in-depth premium lesson series that cover more conceptual things or things that take longer to explain. And I, you know, I give them the full attention of my creative abilities and I put them out there. I do the best that I can. And a lot of the people that watch the free lessons uh, are hungry for more. So they buy the premium lessons. And um, if you get an audience of, I think right now I've got about 12,000 people a month who are coming to this site. You don't need a very large fraction of that amount of people to buy lessons uh, in order to make a living mm-hmm. once, once you've got a decent sized catalog. Right, and so now I've got a couple hundred dollars worth of premium lessons that people can pick from, um, and so, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I don't want to say I'm proud, but I'm very happy with how small my audience is, that and still able to make a living off of it because it allows me to still answer all my email and to be generally pretty friendly with everybody without having to draw too many, too many, too many barriers. But uh, so yeah, I make guitar lessons and I sell them to people all over the world, and that's what I do. How many different styles of blues guitar are there? They tend to blend together the longer the blues goes on. But if you really trace them back, uh, you got the Delta blues, Chicago blues, Texas blues. I would say three or four major ones, but then they've just continued to get blended as the years go on. And then people start taking various styles of blues and mixing them with rock so then you've got blues rock and so it's really it's a it's a very diverse landscape of music uh much to the dismay of certain purists <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there's a lot there's a lot to listen to stevie ray Vaughan was considered kind of the uh, I don't want to say the epitome but one of the signature sounds of texas style blues that's where he was from so the style of blues differs in terms of the chordal structure, the rhythms. What parts of it are really different? And see, this is this is pushing the limits of my uh, blues history knowledge because I'm not I I've never pretended to be a blues historian. But swing style blues, swing beat blues is is common in a lot of different kinds of blues. But the general feel of the rhythm will be different from like Chicago to Texas blues. Uh, and then in some styles of blues, like the, um, maybe the guitar is emphasized more or the harmonica is emphasized more. Uh, and then Delta blues is more associated with slide guitar, uh, sometimes acoustic. And so, yeah, it's, uh, I think in almost every major style of blues, there is the 12 bar structure, even though there is eight bar blues and then you get, some of the older blues musicians who didn't adhere religiously to any bar <laughs> structure. I mean, I can't even imagine what it was like to try and play with some of those guys because, you know, it literally seemed like they changed chords when they felt like it. Right. Um, and you just kind of had to feel it coming. Uh, but the general 12 bar blues structure is something that I think that you'll hear pretty commonly throughout a lot of different styles of blues. It's just that, you know, what, in- in- what instruments are featured and the general feel of the song. I know that's very abstract, but <laughs> what's the best thing about your job? The best thing about my job by far is that I get to work on something that 
uses nearly every creative skill that I have, both in running the business and creating the premium lessons. There was a whole decade of learning that I went through at my job at a, at a software company where I learned a ton of new skills and uh, not all of them seemed very related. But when I started making the guitar lessons, all of a sudden, all of my recording, all of my video editing, graphic design, web design, all of those skills came into focus all at once. And being somebody who struggled with boredom as a kid, like I talked about in school, it was very hard for me at my job to focus on tasks where I didn't have that spark that, that kept me interested. So when I started doing the guitar lessons, I, I don't love to teach every subject, but that, that mathematical thing of breaking down this style of playing into little finite pieces and showing people how they fit together, I could literally do that every day. And so to be able to make my living where basically people are sitting there waiting for the next premium series I put out because they like how I'm able to take something and break it down into pieces and show them how they fit together. And then to be able to use all these technical uh, skills like recording and video editing and and then teaching you know, all together, it's tremendously rewarding from a creative perspective to be able to pour your heart and soul into something that you thoroughly enjoy making and then on top of that, it brings a lot of joy to the people who end up buying it. And then even the stuff that's free that I don't make money directly on the free lessons. Boy, what a great way to end a week. I do this thing called Free Lesson Friday where I'll take – it usually takes me about an hour or two, sometimes three depending on how long the lesson is. I'll take like two or three hours on a Friday and I'll shoot a free lesson and I'll try and get it out by four or five in the evening. And – uh a thousand people watch that in the first day, both on YouTube and on my site and everything. And what a great way to be able to end a week to, to use skills that you love doing to make something that is going to make a lot of people happy. So it's just tremendously rewarding to be able to do creative work that's appreciated by people. That's very practical training. They learn a skill by watching you show them demonstrate how to do it. Yeah. What has surprised you the most? The things that have surprised me the most about this since I started was the kinds of things you have to learn when you start charging money for stuff. <laughs> things change? Unbelievably so. <laughs> um, once you start taking money for stuff, like everything gets more complicated um, to the point where free lessons used to be something I did. Uh, because that was the only way really to get people to watch when they don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And now free lessons are what I do to take a break from running my business. Uh, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a vacation to me. Um, if there were some way that I could make a living from this without having to go to the work of actually selling anything, I would do it. Mm. Uh, because I've had to learn more things about the mechanics of selling something, especially large files in great quantities. I've had to learn and go th jump through so many hoops because there's no established systems really designed to do what I need to do on the scale that I'm doing. And so I've kind of had to roll my own solution in many ways, hacked together with a couple of different services. And on an engineering level, I'm intrigued by the fact that it does actually work and it keeps working almost 100 with 100% reliability. But at the end of the day, I would so much rather be spending that time actually working on more lessons and not thinking about the mechanics of the business. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a huge surprise to me, first of all, the kinds of challenges that I've had on a business level. But then second, I'm surprised at the fact of how well I've been able to understand and meet those challenges when they were not even close to being in my skill set when I started this. Mm. Now, in order to put them up, you have to judge or guess how much bandwidth you're going to need? It seems like a difficult process. Uh, thankfully, I'm at the point now where the system that I have, the bandwidth that gets used when somebody buys lessons is fairly cheap. Uh, so all told, my storage and bandwidth in a given month is less than... I want to say $200. That's pretty good. Um, yeah, that's pretty good in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. 
And that's because I have a pretty high dollar per megabyte ratio, I think. Uh, whereas you think about something like somebody who's doing a video podcast where they're putting it out in HD resolution. If they do a half hour podcast and they compress it with nice quality, that could be like a gigabyte worth of data. And if they put that out there and 5,000 people download it, they've got to pay for all that bandwidth for free. Yes. You know, they've got to pay for it. They're not getting any money on that unless they're selling right. ads. Whereas I'm not paying for any bandwidth that's not being paid for by uh-huh. somebody buying something. Right. Uh, now, it was still a problem to figure out a way how to literally sell this many videos and this much data without literally spending $1,000 a month. Because if I went with any one single canned solution, uh, they they charge an arm and a leg for storage and bandwidth. Unnecessarily so, in my opinion, based on what it what I now know it actually costs. You're using multiple hosting sites then? I have a shopping cart that uh, handles all the transactions and that connects to a storage service where I keep all my lessons. And so when somebody buys something, they go to the download page on my shopping cart and it is retrieving information from my download service. And so I'm paying separately for the cart and for the download storage and, and delivery. If I wanted a solution that combined those things, I would pay more than three times what I'm paying now. Wow. Uh, but to, what I have to do in order to save that money is <laughs> now I've got not one but two systems to keep track of. Right. It's it's more flexible this way. So it's, that's the kind of thing like I would have – I would have three years ago, I would not have even understood what I'm talking about right now. Uh, <laughs> but I had been through this process so many times of trying to figure out the best way to to simply sell my lessons. Um, I can talk about it almost in my sleep now. That's not a skill I necessarily wanted, but that's something that has happened as a result of running this business for three years. <laughs> we'll have more with Anthony Stuffer right after I remind you of the good work being done by St. Jude's. I've got pictures of my kids when they were little, making goofy eyes and showing big smiles. Cracks me up every time. They had so much fun just doing nothing. And, I, of course, I loved making them laugh. Pictures help remind us of those irreplaceable moments. If you love pictures of kids, I got an idea for you. Go to stjudes.org, S-T-J-U-D-E dot org, and look at the bottom right-hand side of the homepage. This is the site for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, and the picture is their patient of the month. Every month you'll see a great picture. They always remind me of my kids and of my little brother. When I was 10, Jimmy was born and he was very sick. Massive brain damage and a blood disorder like leukemia. Many hours and lots of prayer went into his care. Terrible pain. But the moments I remember are the happy moments and his big smiles. There was no St. Jude's at the time, but there is now. When you go to the site and you're looking at the pictures of the kids... It's their happy moments that you'll remember. It's a positive experience. As long as you're there, click on the Donate button. It costs over a million dollars a day to operate St. Jude's. Don't worry, I'm not asking you to give the whole amount. I'm just asking you to chip in. So go to stjude.org. I also added St. Jude's to my Facebook page. After all, how could anyone not like St. Jude's? So, Anthony... Everyone has to give themselves a kick in the pants occasionally. How do you do it? Well, a healthy fear of <laughs> not selling any lessons helps. <laughs> yeah, so that I, I'm not going to lie. That's one thing that sometimes has got given me a kick in the pants to, to keep working is that, hey, you don't know if people are going to want to buy the old lessons today. But I think one of the things that helps give me a kick in the pants to not just sit around and watch TV all day because – you know, if I'm to be honest with myself, there's a certain period of time in which I could do literally nothing if I didn't want to. And I'd still sell my old lessons enough to, to make a living. Uh, I, that wouldn't last indefinitely, I don't think. But um, there would certainly be opportunity for me to slack off and to not face immediate consequences for that. Uh, why don't I do that? I think deep inside, I feel that it is is my responsibility to be a good steward with the opportunity that I've been given. So I think maybe it was Jacques Cousteau or somebody said, a man who has an opportunity to live an extraordinary life has no right to keep it to himself. 
That saying has stuck with me because here I am getting the opportunity to do something that I love immensely and being supported by a bunch of great people who are extremely thankful and, and great cheerleaders for it. And I have so much more that I haven't even had a chance to try and teach yet. I just feel like for me to just, not that I'm against taking a break because I think rest is very important, but being lazy, the thing that I that gets me when I even think about being lazy is that there are other people who may never have the chance to enjoy what they do as much as I am enjoying what I do right now. And I don't want to be a bad steward of that opportunity. I'm sure there will be other people who come along who teach this same style better than I do, but I don't know when that will happen. Right now, I think I'm the only person who teaches this general style exclusively. Um, so it's not hyperbole to say that right now I think I'm doing specifically what I do as good as anyone else that's out there. Mainly, but I, you know, I can't do much. Out, I can't hardly do anything outside of that. But for my limited focus, I think I'm doing that as well as anybody. What if no one else comes along and does this same thing? Mm -hmm. All of the things that I could have taught will not get taught. Uh, and so I feel not pressure, but I feel a great opportunity to do something that has never been done before. And on the days when I'm thinking about uh, eh, just being lazy, like that prevents me from having a bad week. I may have a, a couple of days where oh, I just can't get anything done. I can't focus, you know. But I never have a bad week mm. because that opportunity seems so large on the horizon compared to what I ever thought possible. It it seems to have its own gravity. <laughs> <laughs> it drags me towards it. Let me turn the question around. How do you soothe yourself? Uh, I remind myself that um, what has happened with this business is so far beyond what I could have built just out of my own skill that – and this is where it ties into my faith. I I remind myself that this this thing isn't what it is just because of what I've done. And therefore, I don't need to worry about it collapsing based on something. I don't want to say that I couldn't ruin it, but I never did anything strategic to make it what it is. Therefore, it doesn't depend on me being strategic. Mm hmm to continue being successful. It just requires me to keep doing what I've always been doing, which is to create the best possible thing that I can make for the people who care about it the most. Uh, and so that gives me a great amount of comfort is that even if I had designed for a year how to build a guitar lesson business, I wouldn't have built what I have now because I would have done all of the wrong things based on what I thought would work. Is there an event in your life that has challenged you to the core? I think parenting has challenged me to the core, for sure. Yeah, in some ways, parenting has, has been one of the biggest challenges I've ever had. It's also been the most rewarding, uh, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't also one of the most challenging things as well. Um, my dad had cancer, uh, which was a, a huge challenge. I mean, he's still alive, thank God. Uh, and it, it, you know, it reoccurred a couple of times. Um, and so that um, that was really surreal. And I don't know that, you know, from a psychology perspective, I'm sure I had a whole recipe of defense mechanisms that kicked in because <laughs> uh, there are parts of years after I found out about that that I, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, I just feel like some in some cases I kind of emotionally checked out. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that was definitely one of those cases, um, being worried about my, my dad dying, you know, it was a very challenging thing. If you were giving a commencement address for high school or college, what would you say? What would be your best advice? I would tell people, sounds kind of cliche, but you've got to find a balance between doing what is smart and following your passion. Because as much as I like teaching guitar lessons and all the stuff that goes 
into this business that work. I also like playing video games. <laughs> you could say <laughs> it's a passion of mine. But it's not very smart to do that all day. Right. And so sometimes you'll hear people say, you yeah, just follow your dreams. Well, you know what? If your dream is to play computer games all day and you're not interested in programming, then that's not very smart and that would be terrible advice for you to follow. So I think what I would say is in your life, you are going to have things that are true passions and you're going to have things that are pleasurable distractions. And you want to enjoy both, but you want to put your time into the things that you're passionate about. Because in the long run, if anything is actually going to be successful, there's probably going to be a period where you need to do it without seeing any kind of reward. Mm -hmm. And the things that you're passionate about are the only things that you're going to be able to keep doing through that period without burning out. Um, and so nothing that has happened with Stevie Snacks has been because I – put my nose to the grindstone or, or whatever the expression is. Um, it's just stuff that I'm passionate about that I want to do every single day. And even before I started it, when I was at my job, the reason I changed positions four times inside the same company was because I kept having different passions. You know, first it was a passion for programming. So I taught myself programming and did that for several years. Then I had a passion for graphic design. So I started doing graphic design for them. Then I had a passion for user interface design. And I'm fortunate I was at a company that needed all of those things, so I got to change. But uh, I just followed what seemed to resonate the strongest in me, and I followed it sprinting, you know, <laughs> uh, and a healthy amount of video games along the way, you know. But, <laughs> but I always knew that some things are meant for pleasure and some things are meant for purpose, I guess, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. And if you confuse the two, you can wind up very, very sorry. <laughs> the last question is to help me get better at this process. If you think of a, a story in your life that uh, we haven't talked about, what question should I have asked to get you to tell that story? Oh, let's see here. Okay, well, the one part thing we didn't really talk about that I find not many people think to ask about is what kinds of things happened in the years leading up to this business starting that made it work as well as it did once I did start. I find that people look at the end result. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the end result, it seems like unbelievably like that's just impossible. But if you looked at the 10 years before that, you would have seen a guy who for some reason was obsessed with video compression, who was figuring out the best way to make videos look good with the smallest file size. I had no idea why that was something I even cared about. Uh, but 10 years of that kind of unrelated technical skills, just being obsessed with it is what made this thing hit the ground running when I started. It. And so what you could have asked to get to that story would have been something like, tell me what it was like seeing something start as a hobby and turn into a business and how, oh boy, see, I'm terrible at being you. <laughs> <laughs> so Anthony, tell me what it was like to see a hobby turn into a business. <laughs> well, Ken, uh, <laughs> But no, yeah, that's that's something that I'm very fascinated with. I find that not maybe not as many people are as fascinated by it as I am. Uh, but the most interesting thing about Stevie Snacks to me is that none of it was a plan. It was just me trying something out because I thought it would be interesting to do. And then it just kind of took off from there. And after it took off, that kind of put the previous 10 years into focus. Mm -hmm. uh, I finally understood why. I was inter interested in all the things that I was interested in and getting to use them all in the same one in the one focus was was greatly rewarding. So in many ways, my life did not make very much sense until I turned, um, I guess, 33 <laughs> when this whole thing started. Most patterns are like that. You can't see them until after yep. the pattern is complete. So, how did you pick the name Stevie Snacks? Oh, man. Uh, well, my wife was traveling a lot at that point. And so I was home by myself sometimes for weekends or a week at a time while she was at different conferences. And so this whole thing started out of boredom, 
pretty much. Um, <laughs> and so I put them up and I realized that I needed to come up with a name. Uh, and so I'm not even sure how it occurred to me, but the name Stevie Snacks came to my mind. And the idea being they would be short, mm-hmm. bite-sized lessons in the style of Stevie Ray Vaughan. And so I Stevie Snacks, and it's kind of like Scooby Snacks and from the old cartoon or whatever. Um, and so I did it kind of as a joke, but then literally within three months, there were enough people watching the lessons that when I asked about changing the name, it was, <laughs> there was almost 100% agree. Already set, huh? Yeah, there's no <laughs> way that, like, you have to keep it. And so now what I tell people is like, it's a name that sounds great when something is just an idea in your head you have no plans for. It, but it, <laughs> three years later, when it's a full-fledged business and you have to explain to somebody what your website's called, uh, I said it's one of those decisions that you look back on and just wish that you had planned a little better. But who knows? You know, maybe if it wasn't something as catchy or as silly as that, you know, maybe people wouldn't have remembered it. So yeah. I'm well, not complaining. Once you learn it, it's hard to unlearn it. Yeah. So it works well. <laughs> it's in your head. That's right. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank Anthony Stofer for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much.